Hey, fifth grade. How's it going, guys? Good to see you all. Um, so guess what, friends? We have finished our scene analysis unit. I'm very impressed with a lot of the work that some of you do. I am glad that you took the time to listen to me and to film yourselves, in some cases doing some scenes, and to analyze the inner workings of characters, plot, and exposition. So I think we did very well, and hopefully when we're all back in person, I can build on this unit, make it better. Um, I was glad to hear feedback from some of you guys about maybe instructions were a little too hard to understand. So I appreciate that, I always do. I'm always looking for advice from you guys. And if we all finally ever get back into this building one day, I will go ahead and tweak things and make sure that we do a better job of understanding them going forward. So thank you for your patience with me and um, let's go ahead and move on to one last unit. Because my friends, guess what? We only have three days left together. I didn't even think about that. You guys have map testing on Tuesday, so I will not be providing a virtual lesson and Wednesday is the last day of first quarter, so you all will be switching specials. I'm not sure who you get. It might be on the schedule. Mr. Carlberg might still be deciding that. But um, I have enjoyed my time with you guys. I really have. I'm glad I finally got to teach at the highest level of elementary here at Aug Prep. And I am looking forward to these last three days being a lot of fun. So with these last three days, my friends, I think that I should introduce you to one of my personal favorite writers in all of drama and all of theater. And that would be William Shakespeare. William Shakespeare is an absolutely marvelous writer. He has created many words and phrases and has given many structures of language, like you learn about in English class, that we still use today. And he lived a very long time ago, and he um, is the reason that I decided to become an actor and ultimately a drama teacher. All of his plays, most of them, are very well done and very wonderful, and we are going to learn a little bit about him today. So you see I have 10 spots on the board. Spots that I will reserve for interesting facts about him. But before we do that, I thought it was best to talk about some of William Shakespeare's plays. Now, before I get started, because I know I forgot to do this with the scene analysis lesson and I apologize, I will go ahead and write things on the board that you guys will learn about today. That information will also be included on Schoology. I will have links to some of the pages that I got my information from. So if you are curious and would like to look ahead, that information is there for you to use. All right, perfect, let's get going. So William Shakespeare. William Shakespeare wrote primarily two types of plays. First one I will put over here is comedy. Now, the word comedy is used a lot today. A comedy is a movie that is usually funny, right? It's meant to make us laugh, it's meant to entertain us. There's usually a lot of big, big movements that make us, you know, feel good inside. It's generally meant to be a happy show. And with Shakespeare, the, there's a lot of stereotypical heroes, stereotypical villains, um, and then there's always a fool. The fool was always someone in the comedy who was meant to provide relief. So the overall tone of comedies is that I'll keep the simple. Comedies are happy. Happy. They're fun. And they're generally categorized by a smile. You may have always seen the two very stereotypical masks that are used in theater. One with a big smile on its face and one with a big frown on its face. The one with a smile on its face in olden times was meant to show that the play was a comedy. All right? So we have that. Next, we had a tragedy. Tragedy is a fun word. Tragedy is the exact opposite. Now, you may notice, if you ever look at the website IMDb, 
A serious movie, when you look it up, is listed as a drama, right? That is generally the word that is used today to describe a serious film. In school, it is used to describe just overall theater and acting in general. But a tragedy usually meant that it was serious, Um, a lot of death, a lot of people died in tragedies. And sometimes the main character would turn, usually the main character turns evil. A lot of terrible, horrible things happen. Lots of people die, and ultimately, the la there is a big monologue. Remember we talked about monologues, when just one person talks to an audience. They usually end with a big monologue of a minor character basically coming, uh, who was introduced at the beginning of the show, coming on at the end and giving the moral of the story. So, the stereotypical sad mask that you would see from olden times was used to categorize a tragedy. Tra tragedy, there it is. Okay. So, we have, like I said, comedy and tragedy. So, those are primarily the two you will see. There is also one other, one third pillar, if you will, that you will see in Shakespeare. It's one of my personal favorites. They don't talk about it as much as the others, but comedy and tragedy, we also have, and I'll write this, let's see. Let me tilt my screen so you can see below the numbers. We have... History. They call it the histories, right? A history is exactly like it sounds. All of the histories, for the most part, are named after a king that, or, that truly lived during the actual history of the world. There's King John, there's Henry, Henry IV, Henry VI, Henry VIII, a lot of kings, right? And so mo all those plays are histories. They give an actual account in Shakespeare's own words and language structure of what happened in history. So unlike the comedy and tragedy, which are fiction, let me put that up top, fiction and fiction, the history story story is fiction in a way but all the background information all the characters characters are facts This is a fictitious account, Shakespeare's own account, and an account means a telling, right? The way we tell a story. The story being told is a fictitious telling of events that transpired, that happened in real life. So, once again, comedy, tragedy, history, right? Fact by way of fiction. There you go. Okay, so you may be wondering though, who exactly is William Shakespeare? This mystery man, right? This fellow who lived ages ago, mostly in the 15th century, way back when, who wrote all these wonderful plays. So let's go ahead and delve in, and I will give you guys some very interesting facts about Shakespeare. I will say this before we start, friends. You will not have an assignment for this today. Um, we will go ahead and just talk about him, and we will do some fun activities regarding Shakespeare in the days to come. So you have done my character unit. You have done my monologue. You have done the scene analysis. This unit will finish us off just having a little fun. Anyway, moving right along. So the first fact about Shakespeare, right? 
It's, uh, I do apologize. I said 15th century, I meant 16th century. He lived in the 16th and 17th centuries. So there we go. Sorry, I said the wrong century. Now the first interesting fact about him, nobody knows his actual birthday. Nobody knows the actual date he was born. He is a mystery in that regard. So let me write that down. No one knows his real birthday. How about that? A lot of people think that he was born on April 23rd, 1564. Now, like I said, that's a long time ago. That's the middle of the 16th century. So the fact that his plays are still performed today and the fact that his works are loved by many and studied by many to this day means that his influence was great. But let me just take a greater look here. So he died, or he was born rather, I'm sorry, born on that day, most people think. But that was only three days before his baptism was recorded at a church. Um, and also, many people believe that his death occurred on the same day, which is why it's always disputed. A lot of people don't really know exactly when it was, right? So, what we do know, though, is we know the years. We know that he was born in 1564, and he died in 1616. But most people have recorded that it was the same dates, which is why it's always a little suspicious. All right, so we have that. No one knows his real birthday. Number two. As far as we know... He never even finished grammar school, which is more amazing when you think about all his works and how much people admire them and how much people learn from them. It is generally believed that he finished in his early or mid-teens. So basically, for you guys, that would be about, oh, I don't know, seventh, eighth grade, maybe ninth grade, right? He just decided, you know what? I'm done. And... Grammar school was way more advanced back then than it was now. He learned Latin, he learned math, and religion, along with all the language he was learning. So a lot of books they read um, were very classical, even you know, if you think about that. You think about, we consider him classical, and he lived in the 15th and, um, or sorry, the 16th and 17th centuries. So... Think about what would have been considered classical way back when. So that, to think about writing from the earliest of days would be just incredible. So he applied, uh, let's see, and he used something called a horn book. I'm going to write that word down too, right? And like I said, I will put the link for this page up, friends, so you can see these words yourself. Let me make some room, put right here by history... Horn book. Make sure we can see that. All right. So let me just find this to make sure that it's clear. Let me write, oh, let me adjust the screen. Horn book. So a horn book, you're not going to believe this. A horn book was a piece, a piece of paper that was glued to a piece of wood and covered with horn, pieces of horn from an animal. So they were using, not notebooks, right? They just had a simple piece of paper on wood and they had to make do with that. So we've clearly come very far since then. All right. So that is just another thing, another interesting thing about him, right? And let's see. So Shakespeare also had something called a coat of arms, right? This is uh, very interesting. Wait, actually, let me see about this. 
So a coat of arms is something very interesting. In British society, right, a co uh, Britain is over in the United Kingdom, over in Europe. If you had a coat of arms, which was a symbol, it was a shield that usually had spears going through it, right? That meant that in uh, Britain, in the United Kingdom, that you were a high rank. You were an absolute gentleman, right? So when Shakespeare's father died, he got the coat of arms, and he was able to call himself a proper gentleman. Which is also, you know, we call people men gentlemen all the time, right, today. But to be truly called a gentleman back in the 16th and 17th centuries meant you had accomplished something great and you were highly recognized by your country. So there you go, right? So, let's see, number two we have, let's see, dropped out of school. Dropped. And he became a, an official gentleman. All right, so he's done pretty well for himself so far. Okay, let's move right along, friends, and see what else. All right. Um, he had three children, um, and they lived. Uh, one died at age 11, unfortunately. One died very young. Um, but the, um, they had three children, and it's commonly thought that they didn't, but they had three. So three children. Interesting, interesting fact. All right. And number five, his name was spelled 80 different ways. All right? I know that sounds weird, but given the many different kinds of language that existed back in the day, different translations for his name existed. So the two most widely recognized, aside from Shakespeare, right up here, I will write them down. So 80 names. The most common were the two that we use. This one, it looks like Shakespeare, with the X, right, instead of the K and the E. And Shakespeare. So those are the two that people recognize other than Shakespeare. All right, moving right along. Two, number six. This is my favorite. He, his works are the most translated ever in any other society, in any other society. His work has been translated into 80, again, 80 different languages, such as Chinese, Italian, and other ones like uh, Armenian, Bengali, Uzbek, Creo. And Creo is a language that was spoken in Africa by freed slaves. So everywhere, everywhere, his works have been written. So you can go ahead and take a look at some of these other languages on the webpage when I send a link on Schoology. And feel free to look up these other languages as well because the history behind them is extremely interesting. So. 80, not just 80 names for himself, but 80 languages. Excellent. Okay. We're moving right along, friends. Number seven. All right, now get this, right? Think about directors and think about writers, right? Think about how many movies directors direct. Most directors, I'd say, can direct anywhere from 10, 15, 20 movies throughout their career, right? If they're lucky, uh, most authors, boy, they could write lots of books. Um, you know, a fair amount of books. Shakespeare wrote 39, count them, 
39 place. So, let me put that down. 39 place. All right? So, some of his most famous work, here's what's interesting. Many of his plays, because like we said, we talked about the lack of you know, printing for books back then. A bunch were printed in small booklets before he died, right? So he had these small little books. But some of his most famous plays, like I'm sure some of you have heard of Hamlet, right? There's also another play he does called Macbeth, which is my favorite one ever. And he also did a play about the Roman Emperor Julius Caesar. Macbeth and Julius Caesar were two of his most famous plays, and they were not printed in the little books until after his death, right? Two other men printed 36 of his plays in a giant book called the First Folio, right? So I'm going to write that word down, Folio. The folio is a name for a as an early name for a written collection of plays. A copy of the first folio is on the web page that I have a link to on Schoology. So if you scroll down and you take a look at that, you can view for yourselves a first folio. All right. Now, this is another one. Number eight. Most people, when they write, they use about two thousand words when they write. When all of you are in high school, you're going to find that most colleges and most places you will go, when you write a letter about why you want to attend or you write papers, they usually tell you to have an essay that is 2,000 words. Most people write things that are 2,000 words at least. Now, in Shakespeare's lifetime, he wrote 25,000 words in all of his plays. I'll write that down. 25,000 words. That's a lot of words, which goes to show you just how much of our language he is responsible for. And number nine, if you do a Google search on Shakespeare, so if you Google Shakespeare, I'm going to write that down. Google Shakespeare. Hmm, I wonder what you'll find. You're going to find a lot. If you do a Google search on Shakespeare, you will get at least 125 million results. Write that down. Here, 125 million results. All right. And last but not least, this is the most, this is the biggest one of all. Number 10. Some people, some people don't think he wrote some of his plays. So I'm going to write that down. Some writing disputed. Some people don't think he wrote some plays. In particular, one of my personal favorites, Henry VIII, which is a history. It is a retelling of the life and um, rule of the king, Henry VIII. Some people don't believe he wrote that one. That is a big one. Lots and lots of authors are credited with his writing. Um, Christopher Marlowe is a name you will find. We don't have enough time to delve into who he is today, but if you go ahead and look him up, you are sure to find lots and lots of information. All right. So my friends, I know that's a lot, and I know I wrote a lot, but let's just go ahead and review real quick what we have. So we have the three types of plays he primarily wrote. We have comedies, which are funny, happy, and make you laugh. We have tragedies, which are sad, involve a lot of death, a lot of horrible things happening to people, sad face. We have histories, which are a fictional retelling of factual characters. So fiction and fact. Then 
we have the 10 important facts. And I will just break those down real quick. Number one, no one knows his real birthday. It's been disputed, despite the fact that we know the years. The fact that most people believe it's the same day is disputed. Day of birth and day of death are the same. Number two, he dropped out of school. He dropped out of grammar school. And despite this, he wrote so much language and so many words. Number three, he became an official gentleman when his father died. He inherited what I said was a coat of arms, which was a symbol that let people know that you were indeed a gentleman. You can Google coat of arms as well. That is a great term to Google. You will see what that means. Number four, he had three children. Um, one of who, actually, I forgot to say this earlier, the child who died at age 11 was named Hamnet. Now, Hamnet sounds a lot like his favorite play, Hamlet. So he decided to call the play Hamlet as a way of honoring his child, who unfortunately died way too early. Number five, his name was, translate, was written 80 different ways. The two most popular ones, Shakespeare and Shakespeare, which are fun. Number six, his plays have been translated into 80 languages, 80 different languages around the world. His works have been written in, which is just amazing. Number seven, he wrote 39 plays, and most of his plays that were published during his lifetime were put into a collection called a folio. And don't forget, on the webpage that I will provide the link for on Schoology, you can go ahead and check out the link of the first folio and see what it looks like. Number eight, he wrote 25,000 words, sorry, 25,000 words in his lifetime. It's a lot of words, lots and lots of words, words for sale. And number nine, if you Google Shakespeare, go ahead and Google search, 125 million results. Probably take a whole lifetime to look through them all. So find the best ones and Learn some more. Number 10. Number 10. Last one, friends. Some of his writing has been disputed. And when something is disputed, it means people don't think a fact is a fact. Right? Some people agree with it. Some people don't. That's a dispute. Okay? Some people believe that his writings were written by other people. That's a great thing to find, too. Christopher Marlowe. I will write that name on the board for number 10. Let me erase Hornbook here. I'm going to just write at the very bottom here. Christopher Marlowe. No, it's kind of far away, but let me put a box around his name. C H R I S. T-O-P-H-E-R, Christopher, M-A-R-L-O-W-E, Marlowe. I know, my handwriting is a little fast. I apologize, guys. All right. So, enjoy this. I will post the link on Schoology. Feel free to look at it and have fun while you are doing this. Other than that, my friends, you now have a pretty basic introduction to Shakespeare. So we are going to delve in over these last two days to some of his words, to some of his, maybe a couple of scenes. We'll see if we have time. But... You have done well with me, and I thought you could use a good introduction to the man who I consider my idol, as far as drama goes. All right, friends, I will see you soon. Have a good time, and enjoy this, and I'll see you Friday. Bye, friends.